Okay, my house may be under construction, but we don't need to see a mattress in the shot. <laughs> Being a Zelda fan over the past few years has been a little bit like trying to maintain a relationship with our estranged, twice-divorced, scary, eccentric uncle. He's incredibly strict, doesn't understand modern life, is pretty hokey, but makes the best surprises in the world. It's kind of like he hates us most of the time, but every once in a while treats us so well that I think we all agree that maybe we're okay with a little bit of abuse. <laughs> That's what it's like to have been a Zelda fan recently. Over the past few months, I've become like way more aware of current events in the gaming world, and I've been following Nintendo very closely, and I have a lot more conflicted emotions surrounding Nintendo and their actions than I ever have before. And that's kind of gotten me scratching my head a little bit and feeling a little bit more confused leading up to the launch of Tears of the Kingdom, which despite all of the controversy and the actions that Nintendo takes on a regular basis that I don't agree with, Tears of the Kingdom is the most hyped I've ever been for any single piece of entertainment in my entire life. So despite a bedroom under construction, despite the worst haircut I've ever been given, and despite the fact that I will literally have no time to edit this, and so the format will be completely different than everything else I've posted on YouTube so far, I wanted to take a couple of minutes to talk about Nintendo and my thoughts leak-free and spoiler-free about the game coming out in the next couple of days because the embargo will be up tomorrow. And then everybody who's actually played the game and seen the game will be reviewing it and talking about it, and then my thoughts will be even less relevant than they are now. <laughs> so yes, this video is entirely leak and spoiler free, just to get that out there right from the get-go. Not only do I absolutely despise it when other people do that to me, but I've been actively avoiding leaks and spoilers myself. How do I prove that so that my predictions in this video don't sound like I just played the game and pretended? I can't. You're just gonna have to believe me. Scout's honor. Uh, cross my heart, hope to die, I guess. I have avoided everything not officially sanctioned by or published by Nintendo themselves, so I will be referencing the ads, the commercials, the interview articles on their website, but no art book, no Kotaku screenshots, and no gameplay leaks. So around six months ago, at the very end of last year, I made a couple of videos talking about Zelda and my thoughts, basically making the argument that I thought Tears of the Kingdom would be the best Zelda game we've ever had. And I feel like, based on everything I know now, my thoughts on the matter have only furthered that direction. I think everything that's come out from Nintendo so far, barring the actual game releasing, is kind of working in my favor. I'm trying to restrain myself and not claim that I told you so, because I didn't yet. I suppose it's still a legitimate potential that the game will disappoint us somehow, that some key aspect of the game that we may not know about yet will just kind of be a letdown and really not satisfy that itch that we're all hoping to get. That's not likely. I don't think that that's going to happen at all. I really do think that this game is going to have something for everyone, and that's really the meat of what I want to get to in this video is talking about how I think that this game is going to be THE Zelda game. I think that this will be a perfect melding of the old and the new Zelda. And let me spend the next few minutes explaining a little bit further what I mean by that. So back in the day, all of the original 3D Zelda games were designed with a puzzle box in mind. Ocarina of Time is essentially one massive puzzle box with smaller puzzle boxes inside of it, each of those smaller puzzle boxes being a dungeon, right? The whole game unfolds in a very specific series of mostly chronological events. There's not a lot of player choice. In terms of the chronological progression of events taking place, but also in sort of player gameplay expression, right? There's not multiple ways to do one thing. There's not there's not that feeling of sort of breaking the game, of using the mechanics against what you think the developers intended, even though that's exactly what they intended, like using Magnesis to get over something that you shouldn't, right? These old games are a little bit more withholding 
for lack of a better term. You start playing the game, and you have to do a specific set of events, and then you get to a dungeon, and then the first half of that dungeon, you have to do a very specific set of events, and you are limited. You cannot enter certain sections because you're missing a key item. About halfway through the dungeon, you obtain that key item, and then you use that key item to get to the places that you couldn't get to before to finish the rest of the dungeon. Now, that gameplay loop is really cool. It's extremely satisfying, and that is what traditional Zelda fans felt that Zelda was. It's exactly like a puzzle box. If you've never done a puzzle box before, kind of the idea is that you have to familiarize yourself intimately with the architecture of a puzzle box. You look at all of the sides and open it up in any ways that it's possible to open it up in order to get familiar with all of it. And eventually you find something that looks a little bit different or something that might be able to move or click or turn in a specific way. And if you manipulate that portion, that little small out of place part of the puzzle box, it'll click and open a drawer or open a cabinet or open something that was previously hidden. And that might give you a key or a locket or some item that you can use to insert into a different part of the puzzle box, unlike something else. And slowly over time, you're opening this puzzle box up. And it's a very specific sequential turn of events. So you're not exploring the puzzle box per se. You're not through your own expression drawing on a canvas. Rather, you are basically following you're figuring out the step-by-step -step intended route that the creator wanted you to follow. Those are the old Zelda games. That is what Zelda was. And that's why when Breath of the Wild came out, so many people loved it for what it was, and some people didn't even love it for what it was, but tr Zelda traditionalists were focused on the fact that it didn't feel like a Zelda game. It was Zelda in name and aesthetic but not mechanical. Because Breath of the Wild was all about exploration, player choice, and player expression. If you see something, you go to it. If something piques your interest, you can follow it. It's distraction after distraction after distraction. It's breadcrumb after breadcrumb after breadcrumb. And actually, Game, uh, Game Maker's Toolkit just released a video talking about this whole thing. He went into depth into some of the developer notes that Nintendo released a long time ago that kind of got lost. Um, and to, in an attempt to break down the main thing that he talks about without summarizing the entire video, the Zelda team, as they were developing Breath of the Wild, really wanted player exploration, player-driven gameplay, that the player would feel a sense of freedom and a sense of intrigue. And so the initial idea was to create the towers, which are easily visible anywhere in the world, and to basically make a, a, a complicated network of connect the dots. You have a tower that's a dot, and you'd have a pretty clear and direct line, of a pretty distinct road where you would travel to get to the next tower. And based on the heat maps of all of the test players, players were following those exact lines. And when they interviewed those test players, a lot of them discussed the fact that even though they could technically go anywhere, they felt like an invisible hand of guidance and control, that they were supposed to go a specific place. And this reminded me of my own personal experience playing um, some of the Assassin's Creed games because they are open world and technically you can go anywhere. But also it was pretty clear to me in some of those games, and this was just me at the time. I don't know how Assassin's Creed was for you, but for me, I felt very controlled. In view though the world was big, it felt small because there just was not anything of interest in between those major plot points. Um, even though there technically was, that's that's what's odd. That's that, that's what there's so many deep little nuances about the Breath of the Wild development and specifically the design of Hyrule itself that I don't even know well enough to really articulate correctly. But there's something different about the Hyrule world that has not been replicated in most other open world games. Um, even Horizon Zero Dawn which is one of my favorite games, kind of failed on this front as well, where I really was just kind of moving from major story beat to major story beat. And once I was done with the major story, I have never really gone back to explore that world again. I it, was, it, was, it took quite a bit of like 
calculated decision making for me to leave the main story path, which is a shame. I'm not sure if Horizon Forbidden West fixed any of those issues. I haven't gotten around to playing it yet. Um, Elden Ring was one of the first modern games to comparatively replicate that sense of exploration. Elden Ring did an extremely good job of limiting the play geography and the sight lines enough for players to not get completely overwhelmed, but to leave enough breadcrumbs of intrigue to let the player self-guidedly go from point to point and still end up at the right spot. And to go back to Game Maker's Toolkit's video, that's what he said after the, the, the Breath of the Wild developers spent a long time trying to understand these patterns from playtesters. They went and they redesigned the world a little bit to basically add a trail of breadcrumbs. Now, instead of a clear path, there was just several points of interest. There was an interesting looking cave. There was a interesting looking mountain. There was a shrine. There was cool things to look at. And so now all of a sudden players were running all over the place and not following anything that they felt was a particular line. They ended up where the Nintendo developers wanted them to be anyway, but they felt much more free. Elden Ring is one of the only games that I know of that has released since Breath of the Wild that has been able to replicate that in any degree of effectiveness, where it feels truly free and open, where my individual player play style is rewarded, even though I may play very different than someone else, where my curiosity is rewarded at every turn instead of getting one more boring piece of clothing. <laughs> I made that joke and I realized I may not be editing this video very much. That's what Hogwarts Legacy does. Hogwarts Legacy, as fun as it is, within 10 hours you get a broom and you can go anywhere in the world and now your curiosity is no longer relevant. You can fly anywhere you want to as quickly as possible and your exploration doesn't feel very rewarding because you already get the cool spells and the cool transportation in the main quest. So you just pick up boring clothes over and over and over and over again. Um, and don't get me wrong, I, I loved the 18 hours that I played Hogwarts Legacy, um, but I'm already kind of over it a little bit. And I think that that's one of those, re and I think that this is one of those reasons that the world is cool and it's very open, but there's very little reason to go to, you know, there's lots of points of interest. There's lots of mini games. There's interesting ways to interact with the world. They even, you know, some of the spells even kind of work like Magnesis and Breath of the Wild, but there's just something that I am not a good enough video game designer to clearly articulate or to fully understand, but it has to do with the way that every single thing in Breath of the Wild, for the most part, was rewarding. And the few things that weren't, like the way that weapons were breaking, are being solved by Tears of the Kingdom, but I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. So to go all the way back to what I was saying at the beginning about Ocarina of Time and all of the rest of the traditional Zelda games being intricate puzzle pieces, puzzle boxes, um, Breath of the Wild was a huge sidestep, an incredible one, one that actually established Zelda as more of a household name than it already was and made it the best selling Zelda game, but it didn't feel like a traditional Zelda game. Here is the crux of this video that's taken me quite a while to get to. Zelda Tears of the Kingdom, Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom, from multiple angles, is set up to be the perfect successor to not only Breath of the Wild, but to the legacy of the traditional Zelda game. And there's a few reasons for this. Nintendo is actually listening to fans and implementing things that fans wanted. Nintendo had a ton of ideas that they wanted to incorporate into Breath of the Wild, but that they couldn't for both time development reasons and Wii U hardware limitations. And all of those things are now going into Tears of the Kingdom. And, you know, this is the big joke. We're all saying this. Breath of the Wild is now starting to look like a tech demo in comparison to Tears of the Kingdom because Tears of the Kingdom is everything that Breath of the Wild was plus a whole lot more. And this is where it starts getting really, really exciting, right? We obviously have Sky Islands. And those have been marketed for a long time. And those are extremely exciting. It adds a massive new layer of verticality. Um, even it, I, I'm going to get to referencing some of these interviews that Nintendo has been releasing. If you haven't seen those, you should really go check them out. Just look up, you know, Zelda interviews on Nintendo. There's been three so far. 
Um, by the time this video comes out, the last two will probably be up or they will be up in the next few hours tomorrow. But, you know, Sky Islands add massive verticality. Now, Breath of the Wild was already fairly vertical. Um, Mark Brown and Game Maker's Toolkit in that same video talks about how Breath of the Wild was designed in triangles where each mountain ridge, each piece in general is a big triangle purposefully obscuring part of the horizon line. So there was some verticality, but you, you climbed and it was slow and it was essentially one plane that had been crumpled, right? There wasn't a lot of things underneath. There weren't a lot of caves. And there wasn't anything floating above. And obviously, we now have floating sky islands and confirmed in this last interview, for sure, for sure, for sure, because there was a small doubt in my mind, but there are caverns. So that's super exciting. Um, but the next thing, and the thing that really caused me to decide to finally make this one dumb last final thoughts video, is the fact that in this last interview, it was confirmed um, that there are traditional, complicated, aesthetically, regionally themed in aesthetics, traditional, to say again, Zelda dungeons. Apparently, I mean, the, the developers made the direct comparison to the Divine Beasts, calling the Divine Beasts the dungeons from Breath of the Wild, and they specifically say that they listen to the fans, that they made these dungeons much more long and much more complex, that they are regionally themed to match the aesthetics of each area in which they are located, and that is cool. If you were around watching my original Zelda videos, you'll know that a big theme in the comments sections of those videos and that I addressed in later videos was kind of the conflict between the new Zelda fans and the old Zelda fans. Um, you have kind of the Zelda enthusiasts who just love anything Zelda and felt like Breath of the Wild was an amazing step in the right direction. And then you have the Zelda traditionalists or purists, whatever you want to call them, who liked Breath of the Wild for what it was, but were extremely disappointed over and over and over again by repetitious, redundant shrines and repetitious, boring, samey, not even quite dungeon divine beasts. A lot of key portions of what made Zelda Zelda was gone. This mystery box puzzling system was completely gone. There was a more of an emphasis on exploration, but less of a in-your-face aesthetic. Breath of the Wild was lacking things. This is the point. Tears of the Kingdom will not only be everything that we already knew it was going to be, which is Breath of the Wild plus. You know, it's the same high rule, different points of interest. Same high rule, massively expanded beneath and above. The same high rule, but a bunch of new abilities and powers and mechanics. Everything points to it also providing much more of the traditional Zelda feel for Zelda traditionalists, which I am excited about because I would love nothing more than for this game to be a big unification of what has become a splintering fan base. I would love nothing more than for Tears of the Kingdom to give every sub-genre, every sub-community what they want so that this can be the Zelda game, so that this can be the magnum opus of Nintendo until they make the next one. Because up until this point, they keep one-upping themselves, and we're all trying to figure out how. <laughs> As I said in the beginning, I have never been more hyped for a single piece of media or entertainment in my entire life. Breath of the Wild really was my main massive introduction to the world of gaming. It was magic, lightning in a bottle, changed my life. Not to be too sappy, it's a video game, but really did change my life in a few key ways. It was massively inspirational and made me look at the world and what was possible a little bit differently. And for its direct sequel to be so true to the spirit, to be reusing the same assets and to be expanding on that same world is so fucking exciting. I had better be done talking. I have to edit this down a little bit and I need to get this out before the night is over to beat the official media crowd. I hope we all have a wonderful time playing this game all weekend and over the next years to come. I'm just so giddy thinking about a return 
to Hyrule.